talking about prairie and ball in the backyard in the backyard prairie. So what what am I going to 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 cut to cover tonight? Um, it's my understanding. I think that um, you had Ken Robertson. Is that right? Talk talk about prairie uh, earlier in the year. And yes. uh, okay, very good. So so I might there might be some overlap and uh, with what with what Ken said and talked about, but also I want to, you know, start on the, on the, you know, have us all on the same page of when we're talking about prairie and what is this thing, prairie. And so in this talk, we'll, we'll journey into the tall grass. Specifically, we'll, we'll, we'll journey with Fred and his wife, Nancy, as they dreamed and then worked to recreate a little bit of tall grass prairie in their backyard. So I'll start with briefly talking about prairie in general what it is, you know, what it is, what it was in, 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 in Illinois. I'm, I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with that story, but it, it always bears repeating. I'll then tell you about uh, the backyard prairie, how it came to be, um, some challenges of establishing and manage, managing prairie, changes in plants and animals observed over time. Um, the, you know, briefly the importance of fire and then the beauty that was revealed in lessons um, learned along the way. So I, I share the story of the Backyard Prairie to celebrate small projects as well as to encourage you and others, um, you know, to consider doing the same or, or supporting projects. So I'm happy to pass along that inspiration and knowledge. Um, in the time we have, I won't be able to go into, into fine details or specifics about how to plant and manage prairie um, because every, every project is, is unique. And as, uh, as, as an employee of the University of, of Illinois, um, uh, I'm going to uh, start with a land acknowledgement statement. So in this talk, I refer to the historic landscape of Illinois. The late 18th and early 19th centuries saw the influx of and settlement of Euro-Americans in Illinois, but this landscape was not empty of people before or during that time. So I would like to recognize and acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Odawa, Sak, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Patawatomi, Ojibwa, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. And these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. And as a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a responsibility to, to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution for over 150 years. So we are obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role that this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and centering of Native peoples is a start as, as we move forward. So. Illinois is, is the prairie state. When you or I or others think of our landscape, the landscape of Illinois, we inevitably think about urban areas in our state, Chicago, Springfield, East St. Louis, Rockford, Peoria, as well as the vast fields of corn and soy. And of course, I always ask, well, is, is, that, is that all that's here? Well, certainly not. So let's talk about, uh, you know, about the ecosystem that gives Illinois it's its name. So just so we're all on the same page. What do I what do I mean when I say prairie? This word comes from the French language. It is the name given to the native grassland that covers the central portion of North America. And so prairie is an ecosystem where the forces of climate, geology, grazing, and fire favor vegetation containing few trees or shrubs, characterized by mixed herbaceous vegetation and um, dominated by, by grasses. And the landscape in the center of North America um, greatly favored the development of grassland, our flat to ro rolling terrain, adequate amounts of rainfall, cold winters and hot, hot summers. And geologists tell us that, of course, continental glaciers advanced and retreated across parts of North America one and a half, you know, but 1.5 million to about 12,000 years ago. And these massive flows of ice shaped our landscape and deposited what was to become some of the most uh, fertile so soil in, 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 in the world. So that's the uh, a brief, you know, a, a speedy thumbnail look at, you know, our shape of our landscape 
evolutionary time and you know these forces that came came to be um to to help create the the prairie of the prairie state well when the glaciers melted and receded um we our colleagues and scientists tell us that forests invaded this area for a brief period and the climate continued to become warmer and drier about seven thousand seven eight thousand years ago and this along with fire favored prairie o over over forest the grasses and wildflowers that define prairie have evolved to be deep-rooted long-lived species um, well adapted to survive our hot hot, hot summers periodic droughts, cold winters, fires, and grazing by, by mammals and insects. You're probably well, well acquainted with our, you know, these deep-rooted per, uh, perennial species. The, the tick marks along the side here are, are about one foot intervals. So if, you know, if we're looking at uh, you know, pra prairie dock that's one, two, three, four, five, six feet tall, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, seven, um, you know the root, the root, the roots, the roots go go deep and help build um, these wonderfully uh, fertile soils uh, that make Illinois have some of the best ag land in in the world. Um, grasses may dominate the prairie, but I do want to emphasize that most of the botanical diversity comes from hundreds of species of of wildflowers. I have a, a colleague, John, John Taft, who um, who who would like sometimes like to to uh, rebrand our prairie from a grassland to maybe a wildflower land or a, a four a four bland these flowering um, herbaceous um, uh, per perennials so so really most of the botanical diversity and 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 um, really comes from all of these species of of, of wildflowers not um, not just the defining defining grasses of course we live in this eastern most extension of uh, of prairie of this grassland in North America, where we get the adequate rainfall um, uh, for the vegetation to grow to some of its ma ma and the species to grow to some of its maximum heights. And so, um, tall grass prairie once covered much of Illinois and Iowa, as well as uh, parts of Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Missouri extending to eastern Nebraska, Kansas, the Dakotas, and parts of, of Texas. Of course, further west, there's mid and short grass prairie that does extend all the way to, to the Rocky Mountains. And uh, sometimes, um, you know, we're here in central Illinois, we're part of what, what's sometimes called the Prairie, prairie Peninsula, this easternmost um, area. So I'm guessing that uh, you know that over the last 200 years or so, this unique um, e ecosystem, um, you know, has, you know, has fallen to the plow as Euro-American settlers who came into this area in the 19th century realized that the soil that lay beneath the grass and flowers was um, very, very, very fertile. So based on work by Roger Anderson, Diane Safoni, and others, we know that prairie once covered, you know, over 20 million acres in, in Illinois. Um, of course, this, this view of, of this dichotomy between forest and prairie is, is a bit simplified because we know that, that there was, and, and in many ways still is a rich mosaic of ecosystems from wet to dry prairies, marshes, savannas, and, and, and op open, open woodlands. I'd like to include some of these uh, historic quotes. George Flower uh, was writing a letter back to um, Thomas Jefferson as he um, crossed uh, parts of Southern Illinois where he says, bruised by the brushwood and exhausted by the extreme heat, we almost despaired when a beautiful prairie suddenly opened to view. At first, we only received the impression of its general beauty. With longer gaze, all of its distinctive features were revealed lying in profound repose under the warm light of an afternoon summer sun. It's tall grass with seed stalks from six to 10 feet high, like tall and slender reeds waving in, 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 a, in a gentle breeze. So we can, you know, um, get some view uh, of, you know, an impression of, of some areas of, of original prairie. 
So what was once hundreds of thousands of square miles of a unique and biodiverse ecosystem is today represented only by minute patches here and there, constituting less than 1% of the original and in Illinois, less than one tenth of 1% um, of, 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 of the original um, the, the original ecosystem. So um, remnants of, of, of prairie, you know, are found in some old, still found in some old cemeteries, some that are protected and managed, some old, you know, railroad rights of ways and areas too steep or with soil um, uh, too, too poor to, too poor to, to farm. Um, those who care about prey recognize what, what has been lost and, and you know, over the past 50 years and more, uh, there have been ongoing efforts by organizations, agencies, and individuals, not only to protect and manage the remaining fragments, but to also reconstruct um, tall, tall grass prairie into this still developing and um, uh, uh, fairly new science of, of, of ecosystem uh, restoration. We're still, we're still learning. Um, but as I end this por portion of the talk, I um, reminisce or at least, you know, bring up some nostalgia from Al Aldo Leopold. What a thousand acres of sylphiums look like when they tickled the bellies of the buffalo is a question uh, never again to be answered and per not, perhaps not even asked. It says he was lamenting and mourning mourning the loss, loss of prairie. Um, so the rest of this talk will, will be about one effort to bring back a bit of nature, um, uh, uh, the backyard prairie. So we may never know what a thousand acres of sylphiums look like, but we can start to imagine with a, a few acres. Um, so here in this, this image shows, um, uh, my friend Fred Delcoman's property. So about 20 years ago, my friends Fred and Nancy Delcoman bought a house on about five acres just outside of Urbana, Illinois. There was a house and trees on about half on about half the property. And the other half was adjacent to um, a, a large um, farm field. The previous owner had leased that area to be farmed, but Fred and Nancy thought that a more Nat natural landscape, Reed Prairie, would make a better view out the front door rather than a field of corn or, or soybeans. So as you can see, so there's, you can recognize the row crop ag here, but then this, this uh, air photo was taken after the prairie was planted. So this had been in corn and soybeans, but Fred and Nancy said, well, we, we, we don't want to look at that. We, let's, let, let's, let's, let's plant a prairie. And so they thought this would make a better view out the front door rather than the field of corn, corn so meat. So here's, here's a little caveat um, th that, that we need to, I uh, need to mention is that the, 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 here's at the top of the image is the, is the highway. Um, to the left is to the north. And here's, here's the house. And the house actually faces, faces west. So, um, and the door, the front door faces west and doesn't face the road. So technically, since the prairie's out the front door, you could call it the front yard prairie, but that doesn't sound as nice <laughs> as, or uh, uh, as backyard prairie. Backyard prairie sounds so much uh, better and, and socially uh, acceptable. So what was the journey from farm field to um, prairie, uh, prairie o oasis? Um, so I'm going to step back and just talk, talk generally now about prairie reconstruction and, um, and, and, and if somebody comes to me and says, oh, I want to plant, I'm going to do a native plant garden, or I want to plant a prairie. Um, you know, I, I traveled, uh, last Saturday up to, to visit some people to, you know, give, give some advice on a prairie planting. So with any reconstruction project, I always ask, what do you envision? Why do you want to spend time and money um, to plant prairie? 
So what's what's most important to you? So so um, write it down, and this will help guide the project from plants species selection to planting methods to um, to long term management. For Fred and Nancy, it was about aesthetics and a sense of place. They envisioned a three acre space bursting with beauty in all seasons. You might have other reasons that include providing habitat for plants and animals, um, conserving local biodiversity, decreasing inputs in, in, into land management, you know, less farming, less, less, less mowing, you know, um, uh, also talking about carbon and car carbon um, se sequestration. Um, you know, there, there's some great research showing that that the prairies, the deep rooted prairie plants really can and do, um, you know, store store carbon deep, deep, deep in the in the soil um, or about edu edu education. Um, do you want to teach others about prairie, about plants, about butterflies, about about bees? Um, and as Fred developed a vision for his prairie, he he set some he set some realistic expectations. Um, and, and this photo is not the backyard prairie. This this photo is Lotus Cemetery Prairie um, Nature Preserve. It's 3.4 um, acre unplowed uh, remnant of of, of, of tall tall grass prairie. And there's uh, there's over a hundred native plant species packed into this into this. Um, three acres. So he knew right away that he wouldn't be able to match the composition and diversity of unplowed remnant. And quite frankly, there's very few reconstructions that that do, um, you know, match the, you know, biodiversity of 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 our remnants. Um, um, but we should keep trying. And and so also being realistic and planning within the limits of 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 your of your resources, time, time and money um, are are valuable because it will take both um, to to plant to plant prairie. So preparation and a plan are important for um, a successful projects. So with Fred, he planned for a diverse array of of wildflowers within a limited you know. Um, budget, you know, looking at 30 or 40 plant species seemed realistic to him. And also um, aesthetics, like I said, the beautiful wildflowers, but he also tried to avoid too, too many tall grasses um, that might block the uh, summer, summer, set, su summer sunset view. Or, um, you know, we could also talk about specifics of, uh, of seed mixes later, um, you know, about limiting also the tall grasses in a small planting that might actually, um, you know, take, take over. Um, so, so Fred had to consider what was on the land, um, how the site should be prepared, um, what seeds to order and how much, uh, when to plant and how to plant, what is the soil type and moisture conditions and, um, what plant species are are you know are are appropriate for for the soil condition? So he, you know, with any prairie project, right? If you to be you know successful and to see grow what you want to grow, um, you need to you need to ask these ask these questions as as you as you plan for for your for your prairie. And as Fred made plans, he enlisted help from. Um, from from knowledgeable individuals. Oh, this this uh, I'm getting ahead of myself and in, in my with uh, with my notes here. So right. So as you know, Fred, uh, here's some uh, you know a shot of the uh, prairie as as it was about to be planted, um, and and just to show you show you some some of those some of those site site conditions and some of what he had to think through. Um, you know, as he was, you know, plan planning and also get getting help. So as he, as Fred made plans, um, he he enlisted um, help from um, not knowledgeable um, in in individuals. So um, who knows prairie in, in in your area? That could be you know personnel from a local municipality or a county or state agency. It could be knowledgeable folks from conservation organizations like uh, like uh, like uh, like your own members in Audubon or other 
not you know conservation not for profits or in my neck of the woods grand, grand prairie friends you know local universities or the illinois natural history survey is also a, a good place a good place to ask right and here here i am at you know at a, at a prairie talk you know with a group of people talking about plants and so um as you make those plans, as you enlist the help from knowledgeable in individuals, you're going to ask lots of questions about those basics, site prep preparation, species selection, planting rate and methods, post-planting ma post -planting management. So Fred and Nancy for their backyard prairie ordered seeds from a commercial vendor and lucky for them, um, they were able to get help from the um, Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, with site preparation and seeding through the Illinois Acres um, for, for, for wildlife um, pro program. Um, so there is no one right way to, pl to plant a prairie, but there are some, so, some, some basic principles. So here, here's a picture of, of the future um, backyard prairie and also and and from the very outset too fred knew he wanted to have paths and walking paths through the prairie so he planned those at the very outset and so you can see the furrows left by the you know by the plant by the planters and of course not um not uh, not planted in where he had planned his his plant his his paths um but I, I'm just going to go through some some ba basic principles that I've pulled out from myself and from from my colleagues. But um, figure out how to successfully plant a prairie every time in every place um, is is still a, a a work work in progress. And and um, you know I interact with a group of of colleagues and other agencies and across the country. We call ourselves the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. And we're, you know, trying to share knowledge and information to, to work towards, you know, get, getting it right. But, but there are some basic principles that we, we've kind of figured out, right? So site preparation is, is really important to remove or kill any vegetation on site you don't want in your planting and try to keep soil disturbance to, to, to a minimum, you know, we live in an agriculturally disturbed landscape. There's lots of weeds and weed seeds. There will always be weeds and weed seeds there. Um, but, you know, get rid of the veg you don't want so that the veg you do want will, will thrive. And then I always, I always advise the plant is as diverse and as heavy as, as you can afford. And when I say diverse, I'm talking about plant plant diversity because right that's this is the um, component of the ecosystem that we're we're manipulating um, this is the one where we can have some some control over maybe we can have a little control over the soil or hydrology uh, but certainly not over all the rest of the the microbes and the, and the wildlife and everything so we can ma manipulate the you know the botanical diversity so um plan for as many species um, as, as you can afford. And this means thinking about including plant functional groups. And when I say that, right, what are the different forms uh, of, of, of these plants and, and their place in the ecosystem, like the wildflowers, um, warm and cool season grasses, the, the legumes, the sedges and, um, and, and the rushes and others. And also to think about what what are what are the conditions on the site, right? Matching species and um, to to those soil and and light con, light um, conditions, right? What what are the soils like? You know, what's what's the soil moisture, soil drainage? Um, and and some advice, you know, I, um, that I'm getting from other colleagues, right? Is also think thinking about blooms and blooming times, and particularly to benefit pollinators. Throughout the growing season, a lot of, uh, you know, say the uh, uh, USDA programs say plant three, but really it's ideally try try to shoot for at least five, you know, spring bloomers, five summer bloomers, five fall bloomers, you know, to, to benefit those those insects and pollinators. And then also, um, this this takes some math and some some homework about calculating the right 
rate and and seed and seeding rate, and it looks like a, a forty seeds per, per per square foot is really ideal. Um, you know, when 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 planting a prairie, and and this this is where it takes the maths, and and the Minnesota and Iowa have some seed calculators, and and NRCS has seed calculators. You know where where you, where you can plug in a seed mix and you know cal calculate it based on an acre or ten acres or you know or more to see how much you would need of each species since um, you know you can have you know sp species like prairie dock that have relatively large seeds which won't have a whole lot of seeds per per ounce but then maybe something like uh, cardinal flower that's going to have you know a hundred thousand seeds in 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 one in one ounce so they're they're wildly wildly different seed sizes of them that, that will take some math to, to figure out but it, but it's really important to get you know enough seeds down on the ground to to be successful and then also just thinking about when to plant right we're, we're so we're so geared here in the midwest to say oh you know when we plant the when we plant our farm field or plant plant a garden right we put we we plant in the in the spring um you know but if we think more of a with uh, uh the natural natural system and those seeds falling off in in the fall and and, and the winter and that th those are really all now that the times you know to plant plant when the most seeds will have the best chance to germinate and grow and a lot of times that is in in the late fall through through the early spring because a lot of species do need this um, period of cold, cold and moist to break dormancy to to successfully germinate and grow, and you really want that in, in the spring um, rather than you know maybe sitting in the soil for, for a year and and getting rotting or get or getting eaten. And then also thinking about good, I always think about good seed, you know, seed soil, um, you know, contact, you know, when when planting, but with you know without planting too deep. We're finding that a lot of our mechanical planters, seed drills and such, um, if they're not adjusted properly, they really put seeds too, too deep in the ground. And so I think broadcasting seeds by hand or with a mechanical device is, is ideal. Um, I know here in the backyard prairie, you know, Fred, the DNR did use a, a, a seed drill on, on this and had, and had good luck. But, but a lot of my colleagues and practitioners really going to, 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 bro to broadcast methods or then coming back and, and rolling it. Um, and, and, uh, and this might be the way to go, especially on a, a small, a small, small planting, you know, and with Grand Prairie Friends, I have led, you know, where we planted three acres almost, you know, completely by, by, by hand. And so um, by scattering by hand. And so it's, it's very, it's very doable. So now that you're equipped with some knowledge, so let's journey into the backyard. Um, let's journey back back into the backyard prairie. So for many years, Fred has been able to walk out the door of his house and into the prairie at any time of the day and sometimes at night and in any season to find the amazing and the beautiful. And lucky for us, he captured many of those moments with his camera that I um, that I'm sure I'm sharing with 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 you with you tonight. Fred Fred um, is is a great photographer and loves to take uh, loves loves to to take to take photo photographs. And of course, he was hap happy to to share them with you know with me for the for the, for these talks that, that we've been we've been giving. Um, oh, wrong click. So, how does a prairie grow? Or oh, seeds are in the ground. It'll it'll grow just fine, right? Just 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 let it go. The prairie will will come up. Um. So, but I'm guessing most of you know that prairie will not instantly spring forth from the ground after after seeds are 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 planted, and it will take time for the deep rooted, long lived prairie plants to germinate, grow, and and flower. So, um, at the backyard prairie. Um, during the fir first year, some prey plants were, were evident. We can, we can, I see uh, black-eyed Susans in, in the photograph there. But there were a lot of mostly annual weeds, right? Mare, uh, mare's tail, uh, the weedy brome grasses, foxtails, and others, right? These, these are, uh, you know, 
foxtail is not native. Mare's tail is native, but these are annual species that are um, that were in the soil and they're responding, you know, to you know to to that to that um, soil soil disturbance. But of course, um, as long as you know what you're looking at, right? Do do not despair. Oh, uh, one thing that Fred didn't do, but advice that, that I give in in this first year too, and and, and that, that might be good is also some uh, midsummer mowing, right? If you're really concerned, right? You see the uh, uh, mare's town and you know the foxtail and buttonweed and and lamb's quarters and ragweed and um, and you know some people then will will in the in the middle of the summer they'll they'll mow this set it high set it set a mower at four to six inches if 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 possible and knock this chew it up and not and knock it down to try to give those prairie plants and those prairie seedlings that we know and and hope are in there give give them a, a, a little bit of a chance fred uh didn't have the ability to do that and and so he just he just let it grow and knew that okay this is a stage it's we're gonna we're going, we're going to, to get through this. Um, but by, by the second year, we, be, we begin to see some of the long-lived species like rosaweed, Indian grass, and, and, and others. Here's rosaweed in, in, the, um, in the middle of this, this photo right here. And by the third year, more prairie plants are filling in the space, and those annual weeds um, were, slow, were slowly um, you know, di di disappearing. It's um, it's still not quite as much much of a weed patch as as uh, it looked in in during that first um, growing season. And and but by the fifth year, oh, we start to recognize plants like oh, thank goodness, right? Some of those seeds that that we put in the soil that Fred put in the soil, they're sh they're showing up. We see the purple of the bee balm. Um, there's that rosin weed can, um, continuing to, to flower in there. Um, the yellow cone flower, stiff goldenrod, um, big blue stem, little blue stem. We're starting to you know to re to recognize recognize those um, those those species. So what about some some of the um, you know challenges we talked about weeds. And so after seeds were in the ground, it was not all hands off and let it grow. And so Fred um, faced challenges, even with the best site preparation. Um, and even knowing that those annual weeds were fading, fading away and fading back, there were other weeds, um, you know, to, to, to manage. By year five, the prairie plants were filling in nicely and most of the weedy annual species um, had faded away, but in places, um, Fred noticed an unwanted, an infestation of unwanted, one wanted plants. The first one, so on the, more on the right hand and top part of this picture is um, giant ragweed. Uh, this is an annual native species that thrives in disturbed soils, particularly in wet areas, but more really water disturbed areas. This is on uh, the south end of, of, of Fred's Prairie, um, where there was water in the spring that flowed off uh, the, ag the ag fields and it's lower and it's a little bit wetter. And, um, you know, giant ragweed, right? It's, it's, it's native. It's, it's part of the prairie flora, but, but of course, unwanted in this um, situation. Um, and because of its annual hand habit, prescribed fire did nothing to set it back. And then, um, so Fred made the decision that for, for prairie plants to thrive in this part of the, of, of the prairie, the giant ragweed had to go. He removed it by hand cutting it in, in midsummer, um, you know, be, be, before it flowered. Um, and then I go back and forth when people ask me about, about ragweed and giant ragweed, right? We, we know it responds to, to disturbance and disturbed soils and, um, and particularly giant ragweed. And, um, you know, but that's just a, a choice that, that, you know, that, that, that Fred made in, the, in, this, um, in this situation. The next species, though, I um, very much give advice to say, um, do your best to try to get rid of it. So the other problem plant was the noxiously invasive 
um, creeping or uh, Canada, thist Canada thistle. This picture is sort of showing it er early in the season. Um, you know, here's, you know, with these uh, smooth, you know, uh, leaves, but very spiny, um, you know, margins. It's fairly easy to, to identify. Um, it's going to have uh, wonderful clusters of purple flowers that really actually the bees and butterflies like in June. But it is a weed that will that, um, you know, grows to the to the detriment of, of other species. So it's a rhizomatous per perennial that, that forms thick span, thick stands. And this species also was unaffected by fire. So I had I had uh, advised Fred it would be hard to control by mowing or cutting as, as well, even though that is a strategy, repeated mowing, mowing and, and cutting of, of Canada thistle to, to try to kind of starve out those, those deep long lived um, um, roots. And so he made the decision, you know, to manage it by spot treatment with, you know, with, with chemicals. And this is something that I advise and I, I, I you know, I, I, I support, we, we have, um, we're, seemingly you know bathed in a lot of noxious um, chemicals but even I in the co course of course course of my work you know professionally and as a volunteer um, will use um, you know herbicides as, as as a tool because they're you know quick and, and effective but also used safely and ju judiciously and also um, with the Canada thistle right here it is green in, in the spring um, and, and it greens up well before uh, a lot of other plants and particularly native prairie plants. And then you, it's easily seen. And then Fred could do spot application of, of herbicide um, without um, harming other, you know, um, des desirable plants. Fire is an important tool to manage prairie. And, and Fred knew that annual burns would be important for the health of his prairie. You know, fire kills or setbacks plant plant species not readily adapted to fire, and so, some of these are non-native or invasive species or woody plants that are unwanted um, uh, in 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 the prairie or in a small prairie like this. So most prairie plants are adapted to thrive after fire, with those growing points underground and roots well insulated by soil. Fire also clears dead thatch, allowing the soil to be warmed in the spring sun, and it recycles and um, re replenishes so soil nutrients. Um, so Fred did plan to burn his prairie. He wanted to do that, and it, but he knew he would need to call in help to do it properly and, and, and safely. So um, that's, that's actually where I come into the picture and where our, where our, where our, our friendship started. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, trained and regularly conduct pr prescribed fire and prairie and forest vegetation in, in, in Illinois and uh, along uh, and, and uh, so I brought the knowledge training and tools at that time, uh, uh, a lot of the tools that grand, you know, hand tools that Grand Prairie Friends uh, had and personal protective equipment um, you know, so that that we could make a plan to effectively and and safely, um, safely bur burn the prairie. And so from the beginning, also, Fred planned to burn uh, about an acre or one third uh, each year. And so, uh, you know, as um, he planned for those the paths, because he wanted to be able to walk through the the back the backyard prairie, but also, you know, those, those paths um, provided a uh, uh, a great way to sort of segment the prairie into three kind of one acre, one acre sections. And, and also then to use the paths as, 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 as control lines. So we could just burn one, one small once, you know, manage one small area each year. So, so that at least, you know, one acre each year was getting, getting burned every, every year. And we pretty much stuck with that um, schedule, at least as best, best, best as we can, best as we can. And, um, and so done right, there is um, re renewal at, you know, af after fire. Here's a shot of some, um, 
some some grass poking up through the 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 charcoal and ash af, after 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 fire and um i'm always happy to answer questions about about fire or really any 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 prayer or or na native plant plant questions um when when we when we get when we get to to the end One of the joys of this project or any prairie planting is watching how the plants and wildlife um, respond over time. And that uh, we discovered that the adage, build it and they will come is, is true. So Fred has been surprised and thrilled with the diverse array of critters that have found and made this um, space home. As you can see the banded garden spider, bumblebees, you know, forcing their way into white, white wild indigo flowers, um, dragonflies, there's no ready source of water, right? Since uh, dragonfly nymphs are, 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 are aquatic. So uh, these have to come from some distance. The iconic monarch butterfly and many other species of uh, butterflies and, and, and skippers, um, you know, call, call, the, call the, the, the prairie home. Um, true bugs like this milkweed, milkweed bug, uh, swallowtail butterflies uh, sipping nectar from 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 bee balm. Um, interesting and colorful moths like this Atlantis uh, webworm, and of course, um, I, I uh, if I'm speaking to Audubon, I better have some bird pictures in my talk, right? And so, um, birds, uh, of course, quick, quickly found um, this this prairie, um, right? Song sparrows, you know, will utilize this habitat. They're not one of our grassland dependent bird species, but you know, it's really great, you know, to see these uh, these species utilize this small space. The uh, common common um, common yellow throat, and here the uh, Cooper's hawk hang, hanging out um, on on the on the weather vane and and the bird feeder. Um, some critters that are probably out there that have also found the backyard spray, uh, space are hard to capture with the camera, right? Fred found this little this uh, little mouse, this juvenile mouse, uh, uh, you know, out there. But we know there's probably other uh, small small mammals, you know, that are hard to find and hard hard to photograph, like. Things, things like things like voles, and then others travel through and are fleeting, like this ghostly image of a coyote as it makes its makes its way um, through through the backyard prairie. So when you take the time to observe nature, you will learn and be endlessly fascinated. So over the years, Fred has noticed differences in wildflower abundance from year to year after management actions like fire. Um, plant species like rattlesnake master and spiderwort, here's the blue flowers as spiderwort in this image, um, do particularly well af you know, af af after, after fire. Um, one year he noticed an abundance of compass plant flowering stems and the next year there were almost none. And this is something I've noticed over the years as well, particularly with compass plant and prairie dock. And, um, and that some, some years there'll be um, in, in a region, there'll be an immense amount of flowering stems and another year there'll be almost none. And um, I wish I would have started keeping track of it 25 years ago because um, I, I can't, I, I don't know why this happens or what these, what these plants are responding to, but the, these are fascinating. Um, uh, bits of natural history to, to, to notice. And then early on, Fred noticed flower heads of, of compass plant and prairie dock. And in this image, this is prairie dock and other species that were wilted and dead. And he wondered why. And as you've walked through some late summer prairies, I'm guessing you've seen this as well. And so he asked some colleagues at the university and discovered the um, sunflower head clipping weevil and here's a picture of, of one, one species right right here and they have a strategy of, of the where the adults um, bite into the, the stem uh, the fla the flower stem of a flower that hasn't quite op opened yet such that it cuts off the, the flow the flow of sap and uh, and then they go and they lay they lay their eggs into that flower head 
And that flower head then, uh, uh, you know, serves as a ready source of food and, and a little home for, for, the, for the larvae as they grow and, and develop. Um, Silphiums, the prairie docks, and the compass plant have very, have very sticky sap. So, um, you know, maybe they're cutting off the flow of sap to prevent that stickiness, that sticky sap, you know, and that, that uh, is a defensive mechanism that might harm their larvae. Um, but this, you know, this, these are other, these fascinating things. Um, if you're trying to collect uh, seeds from prairie dock or compass plant, you, uh, um, or you're growing sunflowers and have an infestation of these weevils, they can be very frustrating. But then of course, they're also from a natural history perspective, also fascinating as, 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 as well. Sometimes life on the prairie, um, especially when you look closely, might seem gruesome um, to, to you or me, um, like this Carolina mantis um, snacking on a, on a fly or looking closely at this Carolina uh, or at this crab spider, you know, who, um, who, pa who patiently waited for the right moment to, to, to pounce. Um, a, a spiny soldier bug sucking the juices out of a monarch um, butterfly, you know, caterpillar. Oh, we're very sad, um, you know, to, to see this, this dead monarch, but uh, a caterpillar, but, um, the, the, the soldier bug is not. The soldier bug is doing what, what it does in, in, in the prairie. Um, the song sparrow ready to munch on a caterpillar and a pile of feathers. It probably means that this bird didn't make it. Maybe dinner for a cooper's hawk. And then that skillful coyote uh, with rabbit on his or her uh, di dinner, dinner menu as on this wintry scene. Uh, through the through the backyard prairie, so we have learned from the backyard prairie journey that beauty can be found in everything at every time and every where. A winter snowdrift sculpted by the wind, um, hoar frost that forms when the conditions are right, a spent compass plant flower encased in ice. The endless beauty of a winter sunset that also highlights the burr oak, um, you know, that graces part of the backyard prairie. And then moving from winter to spring, I love it when the shooting stars bloom and a close up view of, of that spider wort flower, those, those flowers that only last a day or sometimes only a, one, one morning. You have to see them um, and they're, they're fleeting. Summer provides an immense array of colors and textures from the uh, iconic pale purple coneflower to the brilliance of, of royal um, catchfly. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention my constant fascination with the sky and endless array of beauty that can be found in clouds, even when those clouds bring um, a summer th thunderstorm. And we round out the year with some late fall beauty as we see the sunlight filtering through, through the fluffy seeds of, of this uh, showy goldenrod. So one of my, my favorite seasons. Fred and I share a passion for learning about the natural world and conservation of prairie. And I am fortunate that he asked me to be a part of the backyard prairie journey. And then he asked me to help record this journey um, with photos and text in a book published last summer by Southern Illinois University Press. And uh, we're happy to share this with those who, who seek prairie. As this talk comes to an end, I will leave you with a few um, take takeaways. Um, in my humble uh, opinion, prairie is beautiful. Sometimes you must look closely and as Fred uh, found a beauty in the backyard prairie, once he came, uh, and Fred found beauty in the backyard prairie once he came to appreciate its somewhat un untamed um, appearance. Um, the backyard prairie took time and effort to establish, but once established, it's been, in his in his opinion, it's been relatively e e easy, um, easy to, um, you know, ma maintain some work with weed weed management. 
um, some work with pre pre prescribed prescribed fire, but he's been very happy with the results. And this uh, backyard prairie has offered an abundance of lessons in in natural history. It's it's up to all of us to go out into nature, observe and learn, and pass it on um, to to others. And so. Um, I thank you very much for 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 your time tonight and, and allowing me you know to speak and talk about prairie and 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 the backyard prairie and I'm happy to answer um, in any any questions. There have been a few questions that have came in using the chat feature. Oh, great! The first one is: uh, Is it worth trying to grow a prairie that's only 200 square feet? Would it be better habitat if prairie is long and narrow? or more compact rectangular shape? Oh, um, well, you gotta work, you gotta work with, they gotta work with, with the space you have. I'm thinking from, if I'm just thinking from, from a purely man management per per perspective, I'm thinking a more, I'm thinking a more compact shape because then that also has has less edge a lot of times the edges whatever the edges are whether it's a street or a road or a mowed lawn or, or or an ag field um right that more compact shape is going to have have less less edge and so there's going to be less influence from whatever that that nearby have nearby uh land land use is and um 200 square feet that's that's small it's worth it i think so be, because um you know and then thinking that you know adding native plants to our home landscape is also so you know so 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 important and so vital right i think of you know doug doug talamy uh you know entomologist from 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 out east who's written some some books about how he he's thinking it's very important for right uh, to conserve biodiversity you know we should be putting more native plants in in our home landscape so so those small areas are important but i'm going with the more compact shape this and you know if and also fire management too because i've you know i've burned mm -hmm. uh, uh some road right-of-ways and railroad right-of-ways and grand prairie friends that own some of those long skinny um sometimes it's yeah it's easier to manage compact than long than long than, than long and thin but that's that those are some of my thoughts on that did I, and was there another part to that i'm sorry dennis if i oh well, that was the one question but here's another okay question okay this came in now okay very good okay on a sloping area with lawn grass is it feasible mm. to just round up a couple of times to kill the turf and then plant plugs of prairie plants without removing the sod yeah, I yes, I, I I yes, I do I do think I do think so. There's um, um, yeah. So so yes, kill kill down that veg, and that is per perfectly fine and good, especially on a slope. Not to dis not to disturb that, right? Because if you're worried about uh, you know ero erosion with wa water erosion on, on that slope, it's good not to disturb it. And then also um, there, especially with with lawn, there's 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 going to be weeds. There's been some, I've helped with some projects on the University of Illinois campus where we've, you know, sprayed lawn and not done any disturbance and planted. And there's still been a lot of weeds that come up. So I think that's perfectly fine. But, you, but that question was saying, asking about planting, planting plugs, which is, which is, you know, if you're not putting seeds down, right, then, then you're putting some more, more time and care. So, so yeah, I think it's, I think that sounds very, very, very feasible to, to do. Okay. Another question is, is it possible to have a prairie in a small inner city lot? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think so. But it's, and, and that's going to depend on that, also that, that plant selection, right? And what do you, you know, what's, are, are you, is it for beauty? Is it for butterflies? Is it, to, you know, to, to, to educate people? You know, that's where, you know, on a small, like on a prairie garden, yeah, then that's where that plants, plant selection is, 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 is really, really vital. And then also um, if you're, you know, going with seedlings or plugs, um, then you can also, then you can do some more, you know, you know, 
design, um, you know, with, uh, you know, colors or, 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 or heights. Um, so yes, do it. Well, and then also sunshine, because we're talking about prairie too. think about light, light conditions in the home landscape or in the city. Um, you know, if it's too shady that well, but that's going to also impact or, you know, if there's part sun, part shade, that's going to impact your plant selection, right? Um, it just, it comes down to, you know, what, what plants are going to uh, thrive in that site and um, satisfy what you, what you envision. Okay. Another question is, are there efforts to shape the education of turf management and city planning specialists to include more than lawn grasses and ornamental trees? Um, I, I, I hope so. Um, that's uh, generally overall, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, there, there is hope we're having this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen there. I mean, there is this, I, I I'm on a committee, uh, um, here at the university where we are going to, um, develop, well, a consultant is developed most, mostly doing the, the heavy list at lifting and work, but we're developing a new campus landscape, you know, map master, master, master plan, you know, and that's, that's going to be the, the university of Illinois campus and, you know, Champaign and Urbana and, 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 and Savoy and right. And those, we are having those discussions. How do we, you know, have a functional, beautiful, sustainable campus, landscape hopefully we can we can set the you know um this the standard for that as far as i think it's um i know it's a tough job but it's going to probably be city by city municipality by by municipality and people asking for you know especially on the on you know on those public spaces asking for more than just um you know lawn grass and sh shade shade trees um, there's a lot of great information, you know, out there about, uh, you know, having these more sustainable practices and, and utilizing, you know, na native plants, but, um, I'm not sure that there's any sort of unified effort, like across, across Illinois or across, or, or across, across the nation. Another question that came in is, can prairie seeds be planted using slit slice seed planters? Um, yeah, well, I mean, so in some ways, are, are, is that whoever was asking that, are you talking about like, like, a, like a, a seed drill type, type of planter or? Um... I presume. But, yeah, ba basically like you use on lawn, lawn overseeding to, so you don't have to Ooh. disturb the soil. It's for, again, we're getting back to the small homeowner that can't bring yep. in a tractor yep. to do something. And those are, you know, you can go down to the rental store and pick them up, but they're usually mainly used for grass seed. Or, you know, long grass seed. Yes, I, I know, it. Th thank you for, for clarifying. I know what you're talking about, Yale. I haven't, per I haven't personally used that, but I, have t but I have talked to colleagues and coworkers who, who have, who have used those and, and yes, right, but but it but some of it's going to also depend on on the you know the the seed the seeds right with with grass seeds generally are you know rise and fescues and other things that we use for long grass are fairly you know within a fairly small range of sizes and, and uniform sizes where where you start getting some issues is that is with those. Um, with the, you know, some very large seeded species or very, or very small seed, seeded species. And, um, and then also making, you know, the settings on, you know, to make sure you're not, that slice isn't, you know, too deep. And I don't, I don't, re I don't remember what the, you know, the depth settings of, of them are, but I think it would just have to be that, yes, I, I talked to people who have <laughs> used, used them. Um, you know, but there, there might, there might, might be, might be, um, l l limitations, um, you know, be, because the size of prairie seeds, um, 
you know, in, in, a, in a mix, even with 30 or 40 species, they're going to, you know, very, very, um, you know, w widely. So if you're not dumping too many on the ground or not, or not getting enough or plant, planting them too deep. Um, yeah. And then, and, and so, so yes, that's, I'm thinking through this on, on the fly, not have, have, have used it, but hopefully that's, um, you know, that's, that's, that's helpful. I, I think where some people have used those actually is, is actually running those over, over areas without any seed to kind of, kind of rough up, you know, so maybe like you, you know, killed, killed an area of, of lawn and then maybe they'll run, run a machine like that over it to sort of rough, to sort of rough things up and then come back and, and, you know, and, um, you know, do maybe do some, some broad, some broad broadcast seeding or, you know, over a little bit of snow or, or maybe come back with, with a roller or, or, or something, something like, like that. There's a very specific question just mm. came in. What specific type of herbicide would you use for Canada thistle? Um, yeah, it is the, like the, the Transline and the Stinger um, are some of the, are some of the brand names that, to use. There's also um, more recently people have been using a, a milestone. I don't remember the chemical names um, off, off the top of my head, but yes, definitely uh, Transline and Stinger are a couple of brand names that have been used um, um, uh, effectively. And then also more recently, um, Milestone. I know my assistant and I on one of the properties I manage for the university, we, we have uh, some milestone. It's not cheap. And it also has to be used with some caution because it does have some um, carryover in, 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 in the soil. But, but with, you know, with a wand sprayer and spots, you know, we're, we're just spot spraying. We're not broadcast spraying. And it's, so milestone can be very effective to kill um, Canada thistle, and then also timing, um, timing as, as well. Um, usually you spray it in the, you know, from green up, up until it buds to flower. Well, on behalf of the Peoria Audubon Society, we really appreciate immensely the fact that you took the time to speak with us about prairies. There's a lot of interest in it, clearly, and we appreciate it immensely that you took the time to speak with us. So thank you very much. Well, I, it's, it's, been, it's been my pleasure. This is normally when you have a live audience, they'd be clapping. <laughs> I, 